The Honorable Justices of the Supreme Court of the State of Iowa. Hear ye, hear ye. The Honorable Supreme Court of the State of Iowa is now in session. You may be seated. This morning we have three cases for submission. The first case, THE Insurance Company versus Boer. And the second case, Paul's Graph versus Iowa Department of Human Services will be heard orally. The third case, Endress versus Iowa Department of Human Services is, is a non-oral submission and is deemed submitted at this time. So we're ready for the oral argument in THE Insurance Company. And Mr. Doar. Thank you and may it please the court, counsel. I'm here on behalf of the Boer family. Uh, I want to talk just briefly about the uh, statement of the case, so to speak. There are two cases involved here. One is the underlying case, which is a death case. It's a matter of an uh, individual, Stephen Boer, who died as a consequence of an incident at Adventureland Park on the so-called Raging River Raft Ride. After that case was initiated, Guy Cook appeared, defended the uh, Stuart Glenn, the ride operator, and took an appeal, uh, removed that case to federal court, where it's now been stayed. So the underlying case has been stayed in federal court. Then in the meantime, uh, the insurance carrier retained counsel and wanted a determination, a declaration as to whether or not there was insurance coverage here, which would trigger uh, the defense and the indemnification of uh, Stephen Glenn in the event there was a jury verdict against him. So that's the uh, status of the case as it comes before this court. The facts briefly are that Stephen Boer, uh, who again family I represent, was involved as a so-called ride operator out at Adventureland on this Raging River raft ride. The way this ride is set up, there are actually three people that have to be involved. Two of them are what are called loading assistants. They help people on off these raft rides. And the third is the ride operator. He's the one that starts and stops the ride also has various other instructions as to what he's supposed to do. And what he didn't do is really the, the crux of this case. It's a gross negligence case. The underlying case was uh, as filed. And uh, briefly what happened, that you may or may not know about this ride, but the way this ride is set up, there are concrete walls on either side. There's a belt that pulls these rides through the water. And the belt stops and starts by virtue of the ride operator determining when the ride starts and when it stops. So in this particular instance, what happened was the loading assistants have their instructions. They're supposed to go through their protocol. Then they, after the ride operator yells clear, he's, he's above them but close. Uh, then they are to both loading assistants to give thumbs up, and then the ride starts. This is all outlined as pled in a, uh, a training manual and whatnot. But in this particular instance, what happened was both ride operators had one foot on the concrete sidewall and one on the raft as they were helping people and the ride operator turned his back looked behind himself didn't wait for the thumbs up started the ride and knocked both of these fellows off into the ride as a consequence of that the one that uh, was able to get himself extricated he got out of the ride uh, Stephen Boer was not able to he was stunned and the ride continued to operate the ride operator let the ride run and he his head got caught between the ride and the concrete wall where he continually rammed his head into this wall. Ultimately, the ride was stopped and uh, he was taken to the hospital and Mercy Hospital declared uh, dead four days later. Those are the facts of the case. The issue uh, that is before you today is whether or not there's coverage. And it's the uh, kind of the typical commercial general liability policy. And the insurance carrier takes a look at this and says, as did the trial judge, and said, all we really need to be concerned with here is whether or not this so-called Section 1, which talks about coverage, whether that's really the sum and substance of whether uh, there's an obligation to defend and indemnify in this case or not. Our argument is, not only is there coverage under 1, because when you read coverage, it talks about bodily injury. But later, and this is probably key to this whole case, is a multiplex liability endorsement. And that endorsement removes or changes, it modifies the definition of bodily injury to include emotional, essentially consortium loss, which is... Well, you know, I uh, well, let's work first on just uh, uh, Section 1, and then we'll get to Section 2. But in Section 1, uh, 
um, there's a exclusion for bodily injury that is expected or intended from the standpoint of the insured. Uh, expected or intended. I mean, it, it's almost parallel to, to gross negligence under 8520. Um, uh, in order to get gross negligence under 8520, it has to be um, probable uh, uh, or intended. Um, so how, b bottom line, assuming just section one, I understand you have a separate argument, assuming section one is at issue here, how do you get around the expected or intended exclusion? For gross negligence, it's first of all, it's, it's negligence-based, it's gross negligence, but it's not intentional. So there's no intent to harm anybody. We haven't pled that. Expected and, and, or intended. I know, and I'm going to get to So then the inspected, when you look at the way it's expected has been defined by this court, it's substantial probability or it's highly likely. So it's right next to intentional. I mean, and it's used in the context of intentional. For gross negligence, you need a probability. You don't need a substantial probability or high likelihood. So definitionally, you get past that by looking at the way this court has defined that in the past, in my judgment. So that's, that's how I think we get past that. And bodily injury has been redefined, so it includes, like I said, these other losses. Then you get into two, into section two. Uh, can I ask you to clarify the, the claim a little bit? When I, or when I was reading your brief the second time, uh, it seems like you're making a more subtle argument than the bodily injury issue, which is that really there's a category of damages that are not excluded at all from the policy. And that's your argument on every issue that you've raised in the brief is not really whether it's expected or intended, but consortium, et cetera, are just not at all addressed. Is that the argument you're making? That's the, the substantial, that's the primary argument, yes, Judge. Uh, but then the defense uh, raises these other issues, which is why we have to address those. Uh, they talk about there's not an occurrence. They say, it, you know, whether or not it's an accident, it definitely becomes a problem. Accidents not been uh, defined in the policy, so then you have to look at the way the court has defined accident in the past. And again, that fits within the parameters of the way this happened in my judgment. So I think that clearly is covered as well. But then when you get into the section two, which is captioned, who isn't insured, but you look at how it reads, it doesn't just talk about people or entities who is insured, but it talks about risk. It says the employees are covered except for, and then they start listing all these different sorts of circumstances which allow them to exclude coverage. But then, significant to this case, again, this multiplex liability endorsement gets right back into saying, if you look at it, it starts off by saying, coverage provided under the commercial general liability coverage form is amended as follows. Coverage is amended. And then there are six different sections where they talk about, we're going to change, we're going to amend the policy. And it starts off with section one, it says additional coverage. But then significant to this case, it gets into section two, and it says, uh, as they redefine bodily injury, they remove bodily injury as an exception. So it's now taken out as exclusion, but it says additional coverage. It doesn't say additional insurers, it says additional coverage. Every one of these six claims or six items that are outlined in this multiplex liability document talks about additional coverage. I get back to Justice Apple's line of questioning. Um, would it be possible to say that some of the specifications of negligence, of gross negligence, uh, might have coverage and some might not? For example, one of the specifications is that Mr. Glenn just wasn't looking, you talked about that when he started the ride, and that, that that was gross negligence, but maybe not intentional. But then a separate specification is that he failed to stop the ride, even seeing what was happening to Mr. Boer, and that might be closer to the expected intentional category. Would it be possible to, to uh, you know, Make reach that a distinction. result like that? Yeah, I, I agree. I think it is possible to make that distinction, and that's what the defense, what the insurance company focuses on. They want to take, they claim that all the allegations of gross negligence are for events which occurred after the incident happened, and that isn't the case. There are all kinds of, you know, you're supposed to watch the board, you're supposed to watch the ride, you're supposed to watch for the, the thumbs up, you're supposed to give the signal. So all of these things happened before, but I agree. It's possible to say some of these elements could be sorted out, but that's for the trial court to do. 
The issue really is, is there coverage or not, and let that be sorted out later. I mean, one of the issues that happened here, the trial judge got into this expected uh, or intentional and made a determination that, uh, you know, in effect, uh, found a fact. So if there were coverage for some of the specifications and not others, there'd be a duty to defend and then indemnification would be sorted out later on. Exactly. In general, aren't um, questions of state of mind of uh, uh, poor candidates for summary judgment? I agree. And couldn't a jury find that uh, even as, as uh, Mr. Glenn is watching the head slamming that he froze? He didn't intend to, or he, I mean, he just, just froze. And this is a question for the jury to decide whether at that point he expected or intended uh, injury. I agree, Judge. As a matter of fact, uh, there's a Swanson case, 447 Northwest 2nd, 541, 545, which goes to that issue exactly. It says, the jury should be allowed to determine whether the realm of probability had been reached. I mean, th those are really, the, the probability issue, those are really jury questions. And, and why that gets kicked out on summary judgment is, uh, you know, really the, uh, the base of our claim here. So that's really where let's we stand. Go to, let's go to your second argument, sure. if I may. Um, I mean, I think you have, you have your argument under, under Article One or Section 1. We've talked about that a little bit. And then you say, though, um, Section Two, which is labeled who is an insured, um, as you rightly point out, uh, it says first employees are insured, da da da. But you're not insured for bodily injury, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but why can't these uh, um, liability limiting provisions be considered cumulative? In Section One, you have some coverage limitations. Boom, 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 boom. In Section Two. Which, which begins with indicating who's an insured, then kind of says in a left-handed way, kind of, but an insured does not include bodily injury, da, 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 da. Um, can't we read section one and section two as kind of cumulative rather than, I think your argument is they're inconsistent? I, I don't think you can read them as cumulative, and especially if you apply what we're supposed to apply in the context of these cases, the ordinary person, or, you know, the ordinary not a, a, an insurance expert trying to interpret or understand this. I mean, these are adhesion contracts, as everybody knows. The insurance company wrote this 360-page document, and anybody that reads this, the ordinary person that reads this, is going to read this in my judgment. Here's what's covered, and here's not what's covered in Section 2. And especially when you get to that, that endorsement where it says additional coverage. How can you read that any other way? That's really my argument. So uh, our position is that we'd... Uh, urge the court to overrule the, the uh, trial court judge, send it back, and let this case go to trial, which ultimately there will be a trial in federal court should this court agree with my position in this matter. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Dorn. Mr. Lorenzen? Mr. Chief Justice, members of the court, counsel. At the beginning, there are two principal questions the court should consider. First, whether an occurrence liability policy potentially covers a tort claim that requires proof of a co-employee's gross negligence. Second, does the policy issued in this case cover any of the allegations actually made by the Boers against Mr. Glenn? Gross negligence is wanton neglect, and the court should conclude that general liability policies do not cover this type of risk. Mr. Lorenzen, I have a question on that. Uh, I mean, this strikes me as the kind of issue that has to have been litigated somewhere before, you know, whether a CGL policy provides coverage for a fellow servant claim of gross negligence against the employer. Have you been able to find any out-of-state case law that's pertinent or helpful? Um, there are any number of cases that are out-of-state which have considered this type of an issue. None of them, however, um, none of the states other than Iowa have the same standard for gross negligence. It's typically a lower standard, and um, it is not wanton neglect. It is not known peril, conscious disregard, expected injury. The um, second issue, uh, the second question that the court may consider is um, it has to do with whether the particular allegations against Mr. Glenn are covered under the policy that was issued in this case. 
and for the reasons that I will be discussing, they are not. Um, a co-employee has limited immunity for workplace injuries. Um, gross negligence, is, it, it's, not a, it's not a tort claim, rather. It is the limit of the co-employee's immunity. It is the point at which the legislature has determined that the co-employee is no longer entitled to the protections of the Workers' Compensation Act. Gross negligence, in this respect, it is not an accident. It requires, we said, a known peril, conscious failure to avoid it, and proof that the co-employee actually knew that the resulting injury was probable. The injury but, caused um, counsel, could, yes. it, 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 could can they, <clears throat> your opposing counsel thread the needle and say there's still room between actually knew an injury was probable and yet not that the injury was expected, um, that is, substantially likely to occur? Yes, I, I believe the eye of that needle would be um, too fine a point to make. It, 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 too fine a point to reasonably make and distinguish between. Well, is it a jury question, though? Uh, n no, it is not. And that's because of the unique nature of the gross negligence immunity in the state of Iowa. It, it's not just a standard at which the, the co-employee is exposed to a liability. It's also a limit on the district court's subject matter jurisdiction. And the court is required to determine for itself, this is not a jury question, whether the claim alleged is sufficient to prove the three elements of wanton neglect, which all require actual knowledge of the co-employee, and has to assume that either the allegations are sufficient or not, and once the case is tried, has to determine that as well. Um, General liability insurance is designed to cover injuries caused by occurrences, which are accident, accidental injuries. It is not designed to cover known risks, consciously disregarded, resulting in expected injuries. Let's deal with this, uh, what I'll call the Article 2 or Section 2 argument that, that uh, your opposing counsel makes. And I'll, I'll briefly recharacterize it. Um, uh, all right, so, so Section 2 is entitled who is insured. And, Correct. You know, it begins with a, a statement that employees are insured only for acts within the scope of their employment. And then it goes on, though, to say none of the employees are insured for, and, and there's five, six paragraphs, I don't know, but bodily injury uh, and personal or advertising injury uh, is excluded, number one, and it goes, goes down. Uh, uh, and then in the multiplex endorsement, uh, that provision is characterized as a coverage provision. In fact, it's characterized twice as a coverage provision. Um, so I think the argument that's being pressed here as well, I mean, it, it, it says who is an insured, um, but it functions as a coverage provision, and it functions as a coverage provision for... Um, Torts alleged against employees. Um, what's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with that. The only thing that um, that portion of the multiplex endorsement does, which, by the way, it accomplishes a number of different things, is it, it results in a contract which simply reads that the employee isn't insured for acts within the scope of employment. It does nothing other than that. Um, who isn't insured? and what is insured are two different parts of the policy. They are two different issues that must be determined. That's the, that's the cumulative argument, I think, that I made when I was, when I was pressing your opposing counsel. But, and, and, and I understand the theoretic difference, coverage mm -hmm. and insurance. But is Section 2 kind of a hybrid? Um, I mean, I know it's labeled in, in, insured. We, we all can stipulate to that. We all know that Section 1 is labeled coverage. Yet, yet doesn't Section 2 um, functionally function as a coverage provision? And, I, and again, I'm, I'm bothered by the multiplex liability endorsement that talks about additional coverage. And that's the Section 2, who is insured, is modified to eliminate bodily injury. It's kind of implying that there's additional 
coverage in Section 2. So I, it's, it's, it's not quite as clean to me um, as, as perhaps you'd like it to be. Help me out. Well, um, there are parts of the multiplexing endorsement that actually do add coverage by way of definition. For example, the definition of bodily injury is expanded. But um, coverage is used in, in the multiplex endorsement, that generic term, is, is just a, a broad terminology that's applied. But who is an insured here if it's going to be construed as some kind of a hybrid provision? Really, what would happen then is this would be in the form of a um, a reasonable expectations argument, which the uh, the Boers made in the district court and then abandoned on appeal. They don't mention that at all. And it would run something like this. I am an insured for acts within the scope of my employment. Therefore, all of the acts within the scope of my empl employment are insured. That would be like Adventureland saying, I am a named insured under Section 2 of the policy. Therefore, everything that I do is insured. Yeah. I kind of get that argument, um, except why did they put 1, 2, 3, 4 as, 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 as exclusions underneath it? I mean, why didn't they say in the, in the insured provision, okay, um, employees are insured for acts within the scope of the employment, period. We know all the, all the coverage exceptions, and one would kick in then, I think. Mm -hmm. But when you start listing then coverage exceptions, you start to think, well, um, maybe there's an independent basis of insurance in two. Um, I mean, are you following me at all? Or? I am. Yeah, I am. Okay, good. And, um, but the, the view that, that, that my client has of it is that all the multiplex endorsement with this particular subsection does is it, it renders the policy as initially issued to read simply employees are insured for acts within the scope of their employment, period. That's all the multiplex endorsement does. R reading portions of the policy that have been omitted, that aren't part of the contract, that weren't part of the contract issued to adventure lands, um, shouldn't raise any kind of an ambiguity, shouldn't raise any kind of a question because it wasn't there to begin with. There was always a period at the end of who is an insured, employees for acts within the scope of their employment, and that's the end of it. Purpose, were the purpose of these clauses to exclude intentional torts? I'm sorry, the purpose the of primary which? purpose of these clauses to exclude intentional torts. And, 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 I, and I'm not sure I understand your question. The primary purpose of which clause? These exclusions. Uh, no. the, the expected or intended injury yes. exclusion? I think historically what you'll find is that before the 1986 um, modification to the ISO form that there were just intentional injury exclusions. And in fact, reading cases before 1986 or that deal with earlier policies um, won't give you much guidance in terms of how this particular exclusion should be applied because in 86, the exclusion was changed so that it didn't apply just to intentional injuries. It applied to expected or intended injuries, and it expanded the scope of the ex exclusion. When they changed it, were there any annotations as why they changed it? Um, whether there are or aren't, none of those are in evidence in the case and aren't properly considered by the court, at least um, in the view of my client has of it. It's simply what the policy says is what the contract is. Do you draw a distinction, though, uh, between a gross negligence fellow servant claim under Iowa law, which requires knowledge of a peril and that it would be highly likely there would be a bad consequence, you know, knowledge of that, and expected or intentional, which seems to require n knowledge or expectation that the specific injury that actually occurred would result. I mean, isn't there isn't there room to thread the needle, as Justice Waterman said or suggested? I, I don't think so, and the reason why is because the gross negligence standard to avoid the immunity is a subjective standard. In other words, there has to be a finding of actual knowledge on each one of the elements, including that the injury be expected. Um, the, the standard that applies, or at least that's been adopted by the Iowa Supreme Court that was originally formulated by the Eighth Circuit in Carter Lake, um, that includes an 
objective element to it, uh, you know, should have known. Um, but once, once you focus on what gross negligence requires in this case, which is actual knowledge that it is probable, that the injury is probable, then it strikes me that you have eliminated this broader area that could be included, and you focused on something that is a risk that general liability policies were never designed to cover. Um, and in particular, I would like to spend just a moment on the actual allegations that are made, because um, while we can discuss, you know, hypotheticals about what kind of coverage is here. The actual allegations that are made in this case against Mr. Glenn really need to be divided into two different parts. The first part, when Mr. Glenn started the ride without getting the thumbs up and following the instructions, and he, he as a result, Mr. Boer and another co-employee were knocked into the ride, those can and should be regarded as simple negligence. He didn't know Mr. Boer was standing in a place where he could get knocked over. He didn't know that Mr. or didn't expect that Mr. Boer would be injured. It was an unexpected event. It was an unexpected injury. It was simple negligence. Mr. Glenn would have immunity under Iowa law for those allegations. The district court would not have subject matter jurisdiction of that claim if that's all the claim was. The second aspect. Well, I don't know. I mean, it, there's a long laundry list of specific allegations. I mean, I don't know. There's 20. Or, I mean, I, I don't know how many there are, but 15, 20, 25. Um, and they kind of accumulate. I mean, failure to visually check the ride, failure to watch the ride, failure to be on guard, failing to know his role handling, failing to stop. It, and there's a point at which it ripens into gross negligence. Each one of these, I mean, failing to visually check might arguably be well that as a matter of law, simple negligence. But, but when you, when you kind of accumulate them, um, could a reasonable jury, I guess is a question, could a reasonable jury decide that, that the conduct bleeds over into gross negligence? Um, I, I think that a jury could not reasonably decide, and a judge would have to dismiss the case if Mr. Boer, like the co-employee, were were, was able to extract himself from the ride with only minor injuries. In other words, it wasn't until the point at which Mr. Glenn left his station, actually saw that Mr. Boer was caught up in the ride and was in the process of being seriously injured. That's when all of the elements of gross negligence are met for the first time. Actual knowledge of the peril. But then don't you, at this point, have to defend Mr. Glenn given the state of the allegations now, I mean, if it's boiled down to something later on that is limited to what, you, what you're talking about, failing to turn off the ride and allowing Mr. Bohr to be repeatedly have his head slammed into the concrete, that might be a different situation. But that's not the state of the allegations uh, right now, is it? I, I see my time is about up. May I finish? You may finish. Yes. Um, a successful defense of an uncovered claim does not require a duty to defend. If the claim is uncovered, in, in other words, if there is no liability coverage for the kind of conduct that's required um, to be legally liable, and that is part of the insuring clause that says you must be legally liable. We don't defend you unless you are legally liable for these claims. Well, if he's legally liable, there's no coverage. The example that you gave, though, is, well, what if he's not legally liable? You know, what if he's just merely negligent? Well, the district court wouldn't have subject matter ju jurisdiction. My client wouldn't have coverage. And for those reasons, we would respectfully request that the judgment of the district court be affirmed. Thank you. Mr. Doran, any rebuttal? Very briefly, I think it's clear that this contract is ambiguous and therefore the matter should be reversed, sent back to the trial court and for this uh, matter to proceed in federal court and uh, the insurance company be required to defend and indemnify. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Doar. This matter is now considered uh, submitted and we're ready for the next, next argument, Paul's graph versus Iowa Department of Human Services. <laughs>